Well, good morning, everybody. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you all so much for being with us today. If you're joining us for the very first time, we are excited that you are with us today. I would ask for your grace for just a few moments as we have a little bit of family time before we jump into God's Word today. Um, I did want to take a few moments to lend my voice to an email many of you should have received on Friday, and maybe you didn't, but I want to start by summing the email up with one word, and that word is story. Story. Many of you know over the last few months, my wife uh, Jacqueline has had some ongoing health issues, and to be honest, we've been all over the place in our emotions and our feelings about that. But what it did do is that it led us to a place where we wanted to get still before the Lord and really get intentional about seeking wisdom and counsel from the Lord about what our best yes to him is during this portion of our story, during this portion of our uh, life and ministry. And so with that, the Lord is leading us to a time of rest, a time where we are to be fully present with each other and with him, and he's also leading us to relocate to the Raleigh area to be uh, closer to some family and friends that have the capacity to continue to care for us and and support us as we continue to seek clarity around Jacqueline's health issues. And uh, they, you know, they're going to be what many of you all have been to us in this next season. And so that's where we are in our story right now. But our story intersects with the New City story. And so for us, there's an appropriate level of sadness around that. Because in the New City story, there's some amazing and wonderful things that that God is doing. He's bringing some wonderful and amazing people. And we have a ton of momentum, not just as a campus, but as a church. And so we're we're excited about that. We're excited about that. But but that also brings some some sadness. But, But what I will say is that regardless of the story, whether it's Rodney and Jacqueline's story or whether it's the New City story or your story, When we are in Christ, the best is always yet to come. It's always yet to come. And so we're grateful for that. And so I'm excited also that during time of transition, uh, Gabe Smith, who was our executive pastor, some of you know him, some of you may not, he's going to step into leadership here at the Matthews campus. And if you don't know Gabe, he is an amazing, amazing leader. And he's an even better person. So I'm excited about that. I'm also excited that by the grace of God and by the generosity of our our, our leadership, I'll still get to be a part of what God is doing here at New City. It'll look a little different, but I'll still get to be a part. In the fall, um, I, I'm blessed with the opportunity to come back periodically and preach and fellowship uh, with you all, and I'm excited about that. And I do want to be clear about something. Uh, there is no underlining story here. There's no underlining story. There's no, there was no fallout, no drama, or anything like that. To the contrary, Jacqueline and I have always felt very loved and cared for and supported by all of you and by our new city leadership. And so while this certainly brings some sadness to us, we're excited about um, whatever the Lord has next for us. And so um, it's scary, and we're learning to, to trust the Lord. Now, one of the things I said when I first came to the Matthews campus is that it was my heart to be an example. Um, I didn't know it would flush out this way, but, but I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God, and hopefully um, it's an example of, to, to all of you because trusting God is not always easy. Um, and, and it calls for, calls for sacrifice. And so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And so we'll have some time over the next few weeks um, to continue to walk and talk and share with each other. And I'm looking forward to that. And I'm excited about that as well. But I did just want to take just a few moments this morning and just share a little bit on my heart and just ask for your continued prayers and support. And know this, that Jacqueline and I love you all very much. Um, and we are, we are blessed and forever grateful for our New City family. Amen. Amen. So with that, let's take a moment, let's pray together, and then let's jump into God's Word. Father, we just love you, and we're honored for this space of grace. We're honored that you love us enough to create moments like this for us to sit at your feet and to learn of you. And so, God, we pray that you would arrest our attention, that you would deal with our hearts, that you would comfort us, that you would bring peace, and that you would meet us right where we are in this moment where we might be confused, where we might be sad, where we might be um, appropriately uh, in mixed emotions right now. But we pray that you are faithful and that you will meet us, God. And so in this moment, we declare that it's a holy moment. It's your moment. So we posture ourselves to hear from you. 
Glorify yourself, Jesus, as only you can. And we'll be mindful to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor, for truly it belongs unto you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And God's children said amen and amen. I'm going to ask now, if you are able, that you would stand for the reading of God's word. We'll be looking at James chapter number 2, the first 13 verses. The word of God to the people of God. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. The person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said, you must not commit adultery, also said, you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Thus ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. James finished chapter 1 last week with his instruction in verse 27. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Now, if you were here last week, I mentioned to you that in the original Greek language, the word and is not present. And this is an important clue into what James meant as he finished chapter number one of his letter to the church, a church that he was trying to give instruction about, instruction around how to get through what it is you are going through. And so James here is connecting their faithful devotion to God, their religion, with their relationship to God. And we talked last week about two words that could describe our orientation to God and our relationship with him. And they are for and from. For and from. In other words, am I living from my identity in Jesus or am I living for my identity in Jesus? Important question for us to wrestle with and wrap our minds around. In other words, is my life a sacrifice from my relationship with God, or is my life striving for a relationship with God? When I am, when we are living for acceptance of God, I need, we need all kinds of things from other people. But when we are living from an acceptance of what God says, then we only desire good things for other people. In other words, if you want to change your marriage or change your parenting or your friendships or your outlook on the world, then I need you to get this truth. God doesn't want something from you. God wants something for you. God doesn't want something from you. God wants something for you. When we understand this through Jesus Christ, then we don't need much from others. Conversely, we are looking or we want something for other people. So James says in 127 to take care, to be aware of, to have a tender heart for people that are considered the lowest. Why? Because they can do nothing for you. If we care about people who can do nothing for us in return, it will begin to order all of our other relationships and it will keep our hearts from being corrupted by the world. Because the truth is, it will keep 
our hearts from believing the story of the world. This is important. It will keep our hearts from believing the story of the world. What is the story of the world? It's the enemy's story. It's the enemy's story. And truthfully, it's a story that's been told almost as long as the story of God. You know the story well. It says that you can be your own God. It says that it's all about you. It says that God is holding out on you. The story that says you can never be completely fulfilled with God. And so since you're never completely fulfilled in God, then you must take from other people. You are here to consume. He did this in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? He suggested that the garden and everything that God had provided was not enough. You need to take, you need to consume everything. Take this. Eat this. Consume it all. Now, I want you to listen to the two narratives side by side. The story of the world, or Satan says, you are my consumers. You must take everything you can. But the story of God says that you are my, my children which means you ought to posture yourself to receive. What a contrast in stories, right? What a contrast in stories. In other words, what I believe over time influences how I behave. The story that I believe influences my behavior. And so James gives evidence of this in how we speak and how we listen and in our anger. And he also gives this powerful illustration at the beginning of chapter number two. He gives a warning, if you will. He gives us a warning. James begins this section or this chapter with terms of affection. When he says in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, my dear brothers and sisters. The Greek phrase there literally means fellow followers of Jesus. So that's who he's talking to. And then he begins to unpack how we view or how we relate to God and then to others. He compares the glory of Jesus to how we glory in other people. The glory of Jesus and the glory of a well-dressed person, especially those we believe that we can get something from. This is how he starts this section of his letter to people that he loves and he cares about. Then he talks about attitude and others in verses 2 through 4. He says, a person in expensive clothing and a person dressed in dirty clothing come to church. They both come to your place. They come to church, and you make a quick judgment, and you treat them differently. You treat them differently. Why? Because we believe that the well-dressed person has power. They have status. And so our instinct to consume kicks in, and we begin to try to earn points with that person to gain something from them. And so what James is saying here is that this kind of favoritism has no place In Christianity, it says, in effect, that someone who is worth more in the world's story is worth more in God's story. And so this is why James is addressing this here. And someone who is worth less in the world's story is worth less in God's story and to God's people. And so James is foot stomping this because this kind of partiality judges one person's soul as being of greater value than another person's soul. And it does so on the false premise of the world's story and the world's agenda. And so James here is giving us a blunt correction and warning as a pastor. He's saying essentially you are making judgments with evil motives in verse number four. He says you are being corrupted by the story of the world. You're being corrupted by the story of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I saw myself in this. I've remembered times when I've done this, when I've stood in this place. And so favoritism, favoritism is valuing others by the values of the world. Valuing others by the value of the world. And this is not just discouraged by James, but pay attention to the fact that he says it's evil. He says that it's evil. Why? Because it comes from the story of the evil one. It comes from the story of the world. So why is this such a big deal? Why is this such a big deal? This this ideal, this concept of favoritism, why is it a big deal? I want to share three things with you here that he talks about in verse, uh, in chapter number two, rather. The first is God's choice. God's choice. 
James is asking his congregation to notice the people that were responding to the good news of Jesus. He's asking them to pay attention. The poor and the beat up are the ones that are responding. The very people that the world rejects are the ones that are responding to God's grace and God's mercy. Favoritism goes against the way that God chooses to work. Faith and favoritism are oil and water. They don't blend. Faith and favoritism are oil and water. The overwhelming majority of Christians in the first century and today, by the way, live below the poverty line. And so remember, there are 150 some odd theme references from James to the beatitude of his big brother Jesus. You might remember, blessed are the poor in spirit, they will see God. In other words, a poor soul, a soul that knows their need, can see the kingdom and see its king. That's why we talked about before, a, 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 broken, a broken spirit, a broken heart is a heart that's open to receive. And so God has chosen the poor in spending and in spirit to be rich in the kingdom. Now, what James is not saying, James is not saying that God loves the monetarily poor more than the rich. That's not what he's saying. He is making the point that the very people that are discriminated against are the ones that God is blessing. He says it's God's choice. Then he adds two more. He adds two more reasons why this is such a big deal. The second is God's law. God's law. And so in this, he draws our attention in verses 8 through 11, he draws our attention back to the Old Testament law. Back to the Old Testament law. He says to love our neighbors as ourselves means keeping the law. In other words, it's Jesus' summary of the great commandment. Jesus' summary of the great commandment. He says to value one over another is to break God's law. To break God's law. Loving our neighbors as we love ourselves summarizes everything that God wants from us in how we live with other people. This is why James calls it the royal law. The royal law. Because King Jesus says it. It is what matters most in his kingdom. And so all of the law, all of the law hangs together. To break one part means to break it all. And this is the bad news of the, of the gospel because the law breaks us and it tutors us. It breaks us and it tutors us. But this is, this is a big deal because it ultimately leads us back to the gospel. It, it ultimately leads us back to the gospel. This is such a big deal, not just because God's choice, God's law, but also because of God's mercy. God's mercy. I'm living this live and in color right now. God's mercy and God's grace towards me in my life, which if you walk with God long enough, you know it, it doesn't always look the way you think it should look. It doesn't always show up the way you think, your preference and so if we are going to embrace God's mercy and God's grace, it means trusting God. In spite of how you feel, in spite of what you want, it means trusting that God ultimately knows what's best. That God ultimately has everything worked out according to his riches and glory. The question is, do we trust him? Because he is faithful and he is indeed rich in mercy. And so we demonstrate that we have received the mercy from Christ when we show it to other people. Because mercy defines the gospel. It defines the gospel. God's law exposes the ways in which we fall short of his perfect standard. The law breaks us of our human efforts to fulfill it perfectly. But in verse 12, he says, when we look to the law, we are condemned, we are judged, and we are set free. Because the reality is, friends, that all of this all of the confusion and frustration and the things that we, that, that we experience in the world, it drives us for mercy because God's mercy is what defines the gospel. Mercy is the law of King Jesus. Mercy is the law of King Jesus. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Mercy is... Is God allowing a broken person like me to be able to preach to other broken people? That's God's mercy. I don't know if you heard of the story of 
the good woman who entered heaven. The good woman entered into heaven and she used her influences all of her life. She used her influences all of her life to help others. She gave her money away. She built hospitals. She supported churches. She built homeless shelters. She said, I tried to keep score. I tried to do more throughout the good and the bad in the world. And then the woman dies. When the woman dies, she says, I hope I did enough to get in. I hope I did enough to get in. I hope I did 51%, just enough to get in. And so as she's talking with Peter, Peter's adding up all of her amazing works. The woman says, I hope it's 51%. And so Peter repeats all of those things to her and says, it's 2%. It's 2%. And then the lady responds to Peter and says, what? All the things I did? The hospitals, I did you hear me? The hospitals I built, I built. All of the amazing things I did with the time and the money that I had. Did you not hear what I said? How can that be? God have mercy on me. To which Peter replies, that's it. Now you get it. That's the key. Knowing that you need God's mercy. That's the key. Because, friends, this is the crux of the latter half of verse 13 of chapter number 2. Merciful. God will be merciful when he judges you. Because mercy defines the gospel, but mercy wins. Mercy wins. And so for us, this is a moment-by-moment awareness. It's a moment-by-moment awareness that where I stand right now, independent of the emotions and everything going on in my heart, where I stand right now is God's mercy. If and when I stand tomorrow, God's mercy. In spite of the fact that I might be discouraged and confused and I might be in lack, I'm living, it's God's mercy towards me. And so, the bottom line for us is to quit keeping score. Let mercy win. Quit keeping score. Let mercy win. When we do that, when we do that, we start living from instead of for. And this is the place, quite honestly, I believe we were created to, to live in. Where we live from a place of God's grace, God's mercy. We live from a place of our identity in Him. We live from God's story and not for the world's story. We live from what God says about us and not from what the world says. Mercy wins. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful and we love you. Thankful that mercy was the law of our great King Jesus. And we acknowledge that we need mercy to triumph over every judgment and over the world's story. We acknowledge that we've taken your grace and your mercy for granted. We've made assumptions about what you would do and when you would do it and how you would do it. So for that, we ask for your forgiveness, God. And we ask, God, that you would not only help us to see this moment as a demonstration of your mercy, but help us to see every moment that you give us as a demonstration of your love and your grace and your mercy. So we ask again that you would comfort our hearts, God. That you would help us to lean into our story. And the faithfulness that you're showing us in our story. And that your story is our story and our story is your story. 
that in spite of the ups and downs, it's a story full of love, of mercy, and of grace. So could we commit our hearts to you afresh in this moment. We ask that you would help us to live our lives in a way that is pleasing in your sight. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, your son.